Welcome to Microsoft 365 Excel, the complete story. And in video number 13, we're going to talk about Power Query to import data from 20 different sources. And for many of them, we'll have to import and transform the data, including the last example where we take terrible data, use a custom formula to convert bad data into good data. Now this is a follow-up on last video where we learned all about M code and custom functions. Now this basic to advanced video has 20 examples and it's an hour and 49 minutes. So be sure to look below the video and click the show more button to reveal the time hyperlink table of content so you can jump to just the topic you want. Now here's the topics we're going to cover in this video. And all of them will do in Excel and Power BI, except for these three. These three are only in Excel. We'll start it off by importing files with a single table. Here are the options we'll look at. We'll do the most important one, because this is most of the time where we get data, importing from an SQL database. We'll talk about Microsoft's Power Platform. And in particular, we'll see data flow as a data source, but also we'll get to see Power Query Online, which is known as data flow. And then we want to talk about the From Folder feature. This is where we import multiple files from a single folder and append them into a single table. Now, there's always potential pitfalls when we do this. So we got a bunch of exciting topics, like what do we do if we move the file, but we want the folder path to automatically update. We'll import files when each file has a single table of data. Then we'll talk about importing multiple Excel files with multiple objects. We'll talk about what happens if the tables have blank rows and columns, or the field names are inconsistent. And then we'll close it out talking about an Excel-only M code function, Excel.CurrentWorkbook. Now, this is the name of the folder that contains all the files and folders with lots of files within them. This is available for download. Wherever you download it, unzip it, and keep it, you're going to have what's called an on-premise folder location. That means it will be unique to your computer. So if you're importing a CSV file, JSON, XML, or an Excel file from your computer, this location will be hard-coded into Power Query. That means if you move your file, Power Query loses connection to this folder path. Now I'll show you where this folder path is in the M code, how to change it, and how to make it dynamic. All right, we want to start out learning how to import a .txt and .csv file. Now going back in time to the beginning of databases, we had text files to get tables of data from one system to another. CSV, the delimiter is a comma. TXT, the delimiter, as seen with non-printing characters in Word, is a tab. In Excel, to import a text or CSV file, data get and transform, we click that button. In Power BI Desktop Home, data, get data drop down, and there it is. Now I'm going to work in Excel, but the dialog box and steps are exactly the same in both apps. However, how we update the on-premise file path is different. So I'll show you the difference there. I'm going to click this button. Now the import process for .txt or .csv is the same in Excel and Power BI. And it's the same for both of these file types. The only difference is that when it asks for a delimiter, here you say comma, here you say tab. We'll start with the tab delimited file. I'm going to double click. When we import from a CSV, this is the dialog box, and it always lists the name of the file in the title bar. We have three dropdowns that will help determine how the CSV file is imported. We have file origin or encoding. 1252 is fine for us, so that works. Delimiter, we can choose amongst the different delimiters. It gets tab correctly. And then for data type detection, you can do it based on the first 200 rows, which usually gets it right. 
You can do the whole data set, but for a big data set, that may take a long time. Or you can just say, do not detect data types, and then you can add them later. Now when we come down here, we do not click Load. We click Transform Data. The reason we don't click Load is because we want to make sure that we have the correct data types. For example, if we don't have number here and this comes in as text, we can't do calculations. Also, sometimes it doesn't promote headers. Also, sometimes your text file or CSV file will have extra rows and no field names. Now let's go to the source step. Up to the formula bar, and there's the csv.document function. That is a data connector that lets us connect to both CSV and TXT files. Down here, we see delimiter. In this argument, we get to say either double quotes with a comma, or this right here means tab, but it's put in automatically. If you ever need to type this in double quotes, you do pound parentheses with a tab inside. Now, there are other data source connectors like csv.document, for example, excel.workbook and sql.database. And then data sources that are files like Excel files and CSV files uses the function file.contents to get the contents of the file. And inside file.contents, this is where our on-premise file location is hard-coded. So if we want to change this later, we can always come to the source, and this works in Power BI Desktop and Excel. Come to the source. You can change it in the formula bar, but it's probably much easier to click the gear icon and then use the Browse button to browse to the new location. Now I'll show you another location, both in Excel and Power BI, that's a little bit easier than coming to the source step. Now we want to rename this query 01 txt file table and enter. Now for every query we do in this video, we're actually not going to load the tables of data anywhere. So in Excel, we go to close and load, close and load to, only create a connection, click OK. In Power BI Desktop, to get this to not load to the data model, we right click and uncheck Enable Load. Now we can click Close and Apply, which means it's not loading this anywhere. It'll keep it up here in the Power Query Editor and close the editor. So I click. Now here's our query in Excel if we want to change the data source later. We come to Get Data, and there it is right there. Click. You select whatever data source you have. Click Change Source. And then you can browse to the new location. In Power BI Desktop, the dialog box is exactly the same. But we go to Home, Queries, Transform Data, and there it is, Data Source Settings. Select, click Change Source, Close. But guess what? There's a dynamic way to get this file to always see the location of this .csv file, even when you move the folder. The trick is, the two files have to be in the same location. As long as you move these two files to someone else's computer or somewhere else on your computer, we can make the update process automatic so we don't have to use the data source setting option. Now, we're going to use an Excel worksheet function to achieve our goal. And I do not know the parallel method to do this over in Power BI Desktop. But in Excel, we have a great function called cell. And this gives us lots of information about either the current cell or our file. I'm going to choose File Name. And in the second argument, we have to anchor the function to some cell on this worksheet. So I'm going to use A1. And when I hit Enter, I get the full folder path, the name of the Excel workbook in the default syntax square brackets, and the sheet name. All I want is everything before the open square bracket. There are two different ways we can do this. The old school way, hey, there's the full name, but I need to get everything before that square bracket. So we search for square bracket, minus 1. And that gives me exactly what we want. F2, the Microsoft 365 way, that's much easier. Now I've got to show you something new in Microsoft 365. I really want to name this cell some defined name and then import it using a defined name. But now, in the Excel worksheet, 
When you have a single cell with a formula or a dynamic spilled array, if you go up to Data, Get and Transform That button, or our keyboard, right click G, it automatically assigns a name. And if we go up to Source, we can see the automatic defined name that was created. Now, that may or may not be a good default behavior, but I'm going to close this, discard. Because up here, if I call this folder path, that's a defined name. By the way, Control F3, we learned all about this back in video 10, of course. There's the name I just created, and that's the name that's automatically created. Now, remember that, because I'm going to try and import this defined name either using this button or the keyboard, right click G. And Microsoft's default code for importing from the worksheet has changed. Even though that cell has a defined name, it thinks it's an array because there's a formula in that cell. I want to go to source. I do not want to use from a array. I'm going to call it, actually, it's fine to leave it there. Just don't send the workbook to anyone who doesn't have the absolute latest version of Microsoft 365 because this array thing is brand new. I'm going to use the define name, folder path. Click at the end and Enter. Now, I don't need any of these steps below, so right click. Delete until end. Hit Delete. And now we're going to use our M code lookup skills from last video. We need to get row 1. And this define name will always have just one row. We use positional index operator and then base 0 for row number 1. Hit Enter. And now we have a record. Also, when we import arrays or define names, as we learned back in video number 10, it always comes with a default name, column 1. That's why when we come up here, we're never going to have a problem hard coding that in, because it's always going to be column 1. But once I do field access operators, now I can do a two-way lookup to get exactly the item in that cell, a dynamic folder path. Now, that folder is the location on my computer where I have all the files including the file I'm working in, which is an Excel file, and that CSV file. What I want to do is extract from that folder path all of the files. Well, we can use folder.contents. We'll close at the end and Enter. Now, just as when we use Excel.current workbook, we get a primary key, folder.contents gives us a primary key on this name field. So if I come down to salesdata.txt, that's the file I want. If I come over to binary and right click drill down, it in the navigation step did key match lookup, which is what we want. And then if we come over and look at import CSV, it did something very different than when we imported a single text file. It put in the actual M code for a tab instead of that automatic set of characters that was hard to interpret. Then it promoted the headers and changed the data types. Now, the beauty of our source step is that it is completely dynamic. That defined name is a dynamic folder path built by the cell function. Now, I'm going to rename this. I'll call it something like 0101 dynamic text file table. Now, we have two text files that we've imported. I'm going to close and load, close and load two. Only create a connection, click OK. Now I'm going to save this, close it. Now you can take this folder and move it somewhere else, which is what I'm going to do. You can also just take the text file and the Excel file that are communicating with each other and then send them off to someone and just tell them, keep them both in the same location. Now I pasted the folder in a new location. This Excel file knows this new location. So when I double click to open it, and there it is. The cell function is doing its job, delivering the current folder path. If I come over to the query with a hard-coded file path, this one should not work. And sure enough, if I go to the first step, the source step, there's the hard-coded path. So it's definitely not going to work. But our second query has no problem. There's our table. We go to source. And we can see there's the define name folder path, which is pointing to the cell function and the dynamic folder output. And sure enough, if I move it again, it has updated again. 
Now, as I mentioned, there is no cell function equivalent over here in Power BI Desktop. However, later in this video, I will show you an alternative using Power BI Data Flow to avoid hard coding that on-premise folder file location. However, if you want to manually change the location, Transform Data and Data Source Settings. Now, importing a CSV file is exactly the same as a .txt file. But this file has a problem. Let's double click. Many times you get data and there's some information at the top. It's not till the third row that we have our field names. But that's no problem because Power Query can clean and transform almost any type of data we get. We got to say the delimiter is a comma. When we transform data, however, there it is, some data at the top. We want to get rid of change type because we don't need that. And sometimes we need to remove rows from the top, sometimes from the bottom. In either case, Home, Reduce Rows, Remove Rows. We'll do Remove Top Rows. We say To, click OK. Then we manually have to promote headers. Right in the upper left-hand corner, we click the little drop down. And there it is, Use First Row as Headers. This is also in the Home Transform group. And now we have a usable table. After we rename everything, then we close and load as a connection only. In Power BI Desktop, it's exactly the same. Here's Reduce Rows. We use Remove Rows, Remove Top Rows. And then when we're done, we right click and uncheck Enable Load. Close and Apply. Now, CSV, TXT, JSON, and XML, which we'll see in a moment, and Excel, all of these files are designed to hold data. However, the next two file types that we're going to look at, PDF file and a picture, these are not designed to carry data or tables from one system to another. However, sometimes you do have a picture or a PDF file, and you don't want to have to retype it. In Excel, we have the ability to use Power Query to import PDF. And then there's a separate feature. It's in the Get and Transform tab, but it's not Power Query, that allows us to import a picture. In Power BI Desktop, we're also allowed to use Power Query to import a PDF file. Now, in both cases, there can be errors, so be careful. To import a PDF in Excel Power Query, we go up to Get Data From File. And there it is, from PDF. In Power BI Desktop, Home Data, Get Data, More. And if you can't find something, this is where you come and look. And sure enough, there's PDF. So in Excel, we'll select from PDF, navigate to the PDF, click Import. Now, because a PDF file can have multiple tables, just like an Excel workbook or an SQL database, we get the Navigator window. We're going to select this one. It looks OK. I'm going to click Transform. Let's go to Source, look in the formula bar, and sure enough, there's a pdf.tables mcode function, and there's file.contents. Anytime we see this file.contents, that means it's going to be working off a column with a unique identifier, in this case, the name, which means in the next step, it's doing key match lookup. It got everything right. After I rename everything, I'm going to load as a connection only. Now, here's the crazy one that's only in Excel. At least I couldn't find it in Power BI. Picture, picture from file. Now, when I select my file and click Insert, this is not Power Query. This is data from picture. And there is a preview. Now, it says Insert Data, but it wants us to review some sections where it thinks it might have made a mistake. So I'm going to click Review. That looks fine, except that one looks fine there, except. Product, except Carlota. You know, here's a Carlota down here, but for some reason this one was a little fuzzy, I guessed. We'll click Accept. Now we can insert data. I just made the cardinal sin, and I did this when I first used this. You actually have to select a cell. If I click Insert right now, it replaces everything here. So I'm going to come over, New Sheet, Shift F11. I renamed it. I have cell A1 selected, and now I click Insert. Insert. And sure enough, it took a picture, and it looks pretty good. Now, the next two file types as data sources we want to look at are XML, Extensible Markup Language, and JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. Now, just like CSV and text, they're both text files, and they're both designed to carry data. If we open up the XML, 
we can see there's a table object and then a bunch of records. If we open JSON, well, we can clearly see the records. And in fact, when we import this, they'll come into Power Query as records. And then we'll convert those records to a table. In Power BI Desktop, the connector for an XML file is more. And there it is. In Excel, we go to Get Data from File. There it is. We select our XML file, Import. We only have one object, so I'll select Records. I see a preview. Click Transform Data. And if we look at Source, open up the formula bar, XML.Tables, File.Contents. But check this out. When we go to Navigation, that's Row Index Lookup, not Key Match. So we know this table right here does not have a primary key. But it got us the table we want. We'll rename everything and then close to connection only. Now for a JSON file, Excel and Power BI Desktop do it in a slightly different way. Here in Excel, we get our JSON, select the JSON, click Import. We get exactly one step, and it uses the connector JSON.document. And it gets the contents with file.contents. And it interpreted that JSON file correctly because these are all records. If you look at each row, we have nothing but records. Luckily, here in Excel, this opens in List Tools. We click To Table. We don't need to select a delimiter. We don't have to worry about errors. Click OK. And now that we have a record here, we can use our Expand button. Click. We definitely want to uncheck Use Original Column Names because we don't want that as a prefix for each field name. Click OK. And there we have our table with the field names. Because all the columns are selected, I'm going to go to Transform. And Detect Data Types is pretty good. So I'm going to click Date Decimal Text. That's looking good. After I rename everything, I'll close this as a connection only. Power BI Desktop, we have to go to More. JSON, click Connect. We select our file, Open. And it's a little bit more polite over here. It used the same JSON.document, File.Contents, but it automatically converted to table, expanded, and added data types. I renamed everything, right click, uncheck Enable Load, click Close and Apply. Now the next connector we want to look at is Web. And whereas with all these data sources, we had to worry about the on-premise location and what would happen if we move the file with Web, SQL Database, Dataflows, Dataverse, Power BI. These will be connected live to an online source. So if we move the file with the data connection, we don't have to worry about an on-premise file location or breaking that connection. Now we're going to connect to Yahoo Finance website. And this is a table of the most active stocks in the stock market. It updates regularly. We want to import this table into Excel and then have the ability to update anytime we click Refresh. Here's the address. And the M code generated when we use the From Web button in Power BI Desktop and Excel is a little bit different. So I'm going to do it in both places. Click. I'm going to paste. There's the address. Now we see the Navigator dialog box. So that means we potentially have multiple tables. We're going to go to Table 0. That's looking good. Click Transform Data. If we go to the Source step and open the Formula Bar, here in Excel we're going to use the M code function web.page and web.contents. Then it navigates. And check that out. It's not doing key match lookup, so there's not a primary key on the previous table. Change type. Now, we might do some data cleaning, like remove the M's if we wanted numbers. But we don't. We want to keep it just as it is. So after I rename everything, we'll close as a connection only. Over in Power BI Desktop, Get Data, there's Web. We'll paste our address, click OK. The M code can see a lot more of the objects from this website. We're going to select Table 1. There it is. Click Transform Data. And if we go to the Source step and open the Formula Bar, there it is, web.browser.contents. A completely different function than it, in the next step, uses HTML.table, converting it from HTM to a table, and then promotes and changes type. If we look up an Advanced Editor, 
That is a lot of M code. After we rename everything, right click, uncheck Enable Load, and click Close and Apply. Now to illustrate this live connection, I move these two files to a new location. I'm going to open them both. Now the first thing to notice when we open this Excel file is we don't get an error saying that we lost connection. The second thing is, if we open it, here's Tesla. Here's the price from yesterday. If I come up and refresh, because this is connected live to Yahoo Finance and the stock market is open with a new price, when I click Refresh, bam, there's the new data. Same thing in Power BI Desktop Home Query. There's yesterday's price. Click Refresh, and bam, this one is updated also. Now in our next example, we want to import data from an Excel file. In Power BI Desktop, Home, Data, and there's a big button right in the ribbon. In Excel, Get and Transform, Get Data Dropdown from File, and click From Excel Workbook. The steps are exactly the same in both apps. We select File, Import, and of course we get the Navigator window because Excel can have many different objects. This is a sheet, this is a table. It's always safer to keep your data in an Excel table because this sheet, even though the data looks correct, if there's a rogue bit of data off to the side, Power Query will try to import it. So we want this object, Transform Data. In the Source step, we look up to the formula bar. Excel.Workbook is the connector to an Excel file. We've definitely seen this before in this class. We'll see it later too. Now the Excel.Workbook function has three arguments. In the first argument, we see file.contents. There's the hard-coded file path. That will deliver the Excel file. The second argument in Excel.Workbook, we've seen this before. This is promote headers. Because we have an Excel table, our headers are automatically part of the object, so they don't need to be promoted. But null means we're not putting anything here. And it did that to get to the third argument. The third argument says, true or false, I want you to delay data types. Now the Excel.Workbook function can determine data types, but the default is true. So when it delivers the table, it doesn't have data types, and then it has to have an extra step. Now here's the thing. If we put false just for kicks, and then hit Enter, well, this step has data types. Then we wouldn't need this step. The caveat, and the reason most of the time it's true, is because if you put false, sometimes it doesn't get the right data types. Like an integer might come out as a decimal, and it takes longer to calculate the formula. So for big data, that might be a problem. So we say true, Enter, no data types. This step is usually going to get it right, and it's faster. Now we have source. Navigation, of course, does key match lookup. We have our data types. Now we can close and load as a connection only. Now our next exciting topic is data flows. And that's an online version of Power Query. And it's located at powerbi.com. That's the website we used back in MEX video number four. And what data flows will allow us to do is instead of using an on-premise file, we can load, for example, an Excel file using online Power Query up into data flows and then use that as a data source so people can connect to an online data source and they don't have to worry about on-premise file paths. Now, just as back in MEX video number four when we learned Power BI, in order to use data flow, data versus Power BI, or data flows with online Power Query, you have to be working for an organization that bought an organizational package from Microsoft. Our goal is to take these two tables, and we're actually going to have to transform them in online Power Query to create one table. And then that will be our data flow. Now, there's a number of ways to get to PowerBI.com. You can do it from within Power BI Desktop or even from within Excel. You can type in PowerBI.com. I usually do it by using my online Outlook, and then this tile up here, I get all my online Microsoft apps. We'll go to Power BI Online. 
Now, as we learned back in video number four, the key to most of what we're doing here is in the workspace. So you have to create a workspace and then add the people you want to have access to that workspace. I have an empty new workspace, MEX video class. I don't have anything in this workspace, so I go up to New, drop down, and there it is, Data Flows. Now there's a number of ways we can connect to data. We're going to import a table, so we want Add New Tables. And look at this, there are a lot of connectors. And a lot of these connectors are the same as in Power BI Desktop and Excel. Excel, Text, SQL. So I'm going to click Excel Workbook. Now we're going to upload a file, so I'm going to click Upload, Browse. This file is available for download. Click Open. And this file will be uploaded to OneDrive on SharePoint. We come all the way down to the right, click Next, choose Data. This is like the Navigator window. We want to select DB Products and FP Sales. Now we come all the way, and here's our Transform Data button. And wow, this looks almost like the Power Query we've been using. Queries, a bunch of tabs in this Data Flow Power Query ribbon. There's the name, which is fine, and our applied steps. Now our goal is to convert both of these tables into a single table that will be our Data Flow. And the first thing we want to do is from Product ID, I want to connect over to the Products Lookup or Dimension table over the product name, price, and cost. And just like Power Query in Excel and Power BI Desktop, Home, Combine, there's Merge Queries, Merge Queries. We want to connect Product ID, select the table Products with Product ID. And this is amazing. I wish this was in Excel and Power BI Desktop. You don't even need to study and know the different join types here. The pictures say it all. Now we actually will study these in our next video. But left outer, notice the picture. That means all from the first, only matching from the second. So it's selected. And left outer is just like doing a normal lookup in the Excel worksheet. Let's click OK. Here's our connected product column with the field. So I'm going to click Expand, uncheck all. We want product, price, and expense. Click OK. There are the new fields. Our next task is to calculate revenue and cost of goods sold. So I'm going to click Retail Price, Hold Control, click on Units. And just as in On-Premise Power Query, we go to Add Column, From Number, Standard, and Multiply. Up in the formula bar, we definitely want to change the M code because I want to rename this column. Double click. This is Revenue. And after each, I'm going to type a space. And we want to round, so we use number, dot, and notice there's no IntelliSense up here, which is good because we don't run into trouble. But I do miss the screen tips that describe the different arguments, comma, two, close parentheses. Enter. There's our revenue. We'll do the same thing for cost of goods sold. Units, add column. We want to multiply. And so for cost of goods sold, I did the same thing, M code to change the name and round. Now we want to remove some columns. And I'm going to select the columns in a certain order. So date, holding control, product, units, revenue, cost of goods sold. Right click, remove other columns. Now I renamed everything over here. And here's the amazing thing. If we go up to Home, over to Query, Advanced Editor, there's our beautiful M code. So all the things we've learned about Power Query and M code, most all of them are going to work up here also. Click OK. Now this is similar to Power BI Desktop because I don't want this table to load. So I'm going to right click, uncheck Enable Load. We don't have to close and apply or load like in Excel. We come down to the lower right and click Save and Close. We definitely want to name this. There's the name. There's the description. Now let's click Save. And now, so we can't see the table here. If you ever need to edit, you come over, click Edit. This opens up Data Flow Power Query. You can do whatever editing you want, and then Save and Close. So here at PowerBI.com, we use Data Flow Power Query to import Excel data, then create a table. It's now in the workspace, and whoever has access to the workspace 
can access this table inside of Excel or Power BI Desktop. Now we'll definitely connect to this data flow in just a moment, but I want to go up to my Apps panel, click, go to OneDrive, My Files, and this folder is automatically created when we import into data flows. We click on Apps, Microsoft Power Query, Uploaded Files, and there's the source file that is feeding data flows. Now later when I want to update the data in the Excel file, I just use Save As and save it to my OneDrive location. Then over here in my workspace, I can click Refresh, or I can schedule a refresh. Schedule a refresh right here. Now that we have something up here in data flows, we're going to go both to Excel and Power BI Desktop and import this data. In Excel, to connect to data flows, we go to Get Data and down to From Power Platform. And there it is, Data Flows. Over in Power BI Desktop, you go to Get Data, Data Flows, and then the process we're going to do over in Excel is exactly the same here in Power BI Desktop. You have to log into your organizational account just as we did back in MEX video number four. We'll click Connect. We're going to drill down to Workspaces, MEX, and the only data flow we have is this one here. We select the table. Click Transform Data. Now in the source step, there's our function Power Platform .data flows. And navigation does key match, but there's a huge ID. Now I went ahead and renamed this, and I'm going to load this to a pivot table. Close and load, close and load to pivot table report on a new worksheet. Click OK. Now there's the finished report, and we did that. And I'm going to Control S, because as the administrator of this source data in an Excel file, I want to update the data. So I'm going to scroll down. This is an Excel table. There's new data below. Point to the corner. Drag it down. We're incorporating the new records into this Excel table object. So when I save, then you Save As and save it to OneDrive. Close. Go back to the workspace. We can click the Refresh button. Or as we saw earlier, you can schedule a refresh. And then whoever's pointing to this data flow can refresh their reports, visualizations, and data sets. So over here in our report, we right click Refresh. And there's our new data. Now the next data connector we're going to look at is another Microsoft online source. We're going to look at Power BI. But this connector does not connect to data sets so we can download data. This will connect to data models that we've already loaded to Power BI Online. This connection can be used in Excel to create pivot tables and over in Power BI Desktop to create reports and visuals. Now here in Excel, there's two ways to access data models at Power BI Online. Insert pivot table, that connector, or data. Get data, Power Platform, and we click. In the Power BI data set pane, we can select a particular data model, click Insert Pivot Table, and on a new sheet, you can see the beginning of the pivot table. Over here is the complete data model with table, all these measures, and the related attribute tables. If we go over to Queries and Connections, not Queries, but click on Connections, that's where the connection lives. If you need to delete it, right click Delete. In Power BI Desktop, you can go to Data Hub. There's the connector there. Or Get Data, and right near the top, we can click. We can select from the different data sets and data models. I'm going to select this one. Click Connect. I'm going to check to select the entire data model. Click Submit. Here in the Report area, you can open up. There's our measures. There's our attributes. And notice there's no table icon over here, because the tables and data did not download. And if we go to Model, this is just a picture of the data model as it sits up on Power BI Online. And if you need to delete that connection, Home, Queries, Transform Data, Data Source Settings, and then right click Delete. Of course, the advantage to having this live connection here in Power BI Desktop and in Excel is that the data model is stored in one centralized location one single source of truth, as they say, and the administrator can take care of the data model while others connect. 
Now the next data source is another Microsoft online source in Power BI Desktop. Get data, Dataverse in Excel. Get data, Power Platforms, Dataverse. And it's exactly the same using the navigator, selecting the table, importing data, as all the other examples we've seen so far. Now the next data source we're going to talk about is perhaps the most important because much of the data in the world is stored in some sort of SQL database. We're going to do an SQL Server database. And I have a public database that you can access using these credentials. In Power BI Desktop, everything's the same as how we do it over in Excel. Home data, and there's the button. Now we're going to connect to the SQL Server database over here in Excel. And interestingly enough, we'll see the coolest thing about Power Query is that when it connects to an SQL Server database, if it can send the SQL code back to the database, the database is much more efficient in running a query than Power Query and M code. And we'll see how you can detect whether the steps you do are being sent back to the SQL Server database. So we're going to click, and here's the credentials. Everything's case sensitive. That E in Excel is capital. That I in is is capital. That F in fun is capital. So we'll enter our server and database. Now, if you know how to write your own SQL, you can click Advanced Options and write your own SQL there. We're going to let Power Query do it for us. Let's click OK. We do not want to log in with Windows. We want to log into a database. This is where you put username and password. And I'm going to select from the drop down the server and the database. Click Connect. We do not have an encrypted connection, so we just click OK. And look at that. There's our Navigator dialog box. Now in other videos, we import everything but the calendar table and then build a data model. We're only going to import F transactions. There's actually 7.7 .7 million rows of data in that table. We're going to click Transform Data. If we look at the source step, there's SQL.DatabaseMCode function. There's the server and the database. And of course, navigation is going to be a key match lookup. Now if you go to everything but the first step and right click. If you see View Native Query, that means this step and everything before is being sent back to the SQL database. I'm going to click, and there's the SQL code. Click OK. Right click. It's grayed out. So that means this step and all subsequent steps cannot be sent back to the SQL database. Now, this is usually an automatic step when you use Power Query. And if you really do want to change the data types, just wait to the end. And so the rule is, in order to send as much of this query back to the SQL database, where it can be executed more efficiently, you want to keep all of the steps where you can see View Native Query at the top of the query. And any of the steps, if you can push them down, that don't have that highlighted, keep those at the end. Now I'm going to use the red X to delete this step. The first thing we want to do is we only want the records for Colorado boomerangs. So we're going to click the filter, uncheck everything, click Colorado. Click OK. Right click, and there it is, View Native Query. So now, so far, there's Select From and Where. Now we want to scroll over. And when you connect to an SQL database that has tables with relationships, in Power Query, it brings those tables in, which allows us to look up an item from a related table like cost without using the merge feature. So we're going to check standard cost so we can get the cost for the product in every row. Uncheck, click OK. There's a step, right click. We can still see View Native Query. Click OK. The next thing I want to do is I want to take standard cost, scroll over, hold Control, click Quantity. Add column, and I want to multiply. Up in the formula bar, we're going to type cost of goods sold. We're not going to round. Click Enter. Right click. Uh, we can still see native query. And sure enough, there's the SQL being written as we go. Now we only want cost of goods sold. I have that selected. I'm scrolling over. Holding Control, click Product. Right click, Remove Other Columns. Right click, Native Query. 
And so there's the advantage of connecting to an SQL database and using Power Query. This will be sent back, and it will perform the query and whatever calculations it needs to do over in the database. This process is called Query Folding. So after we rename everything, we'll load it as a connection only. Now, one of the more spectacular features in Power Query is From Folder. That means we can get Power Query to look inside a folder and extract all the files and all the metadata about those files, too. This feature is great because what if you want a list of all the file names from a folder? Or what if you want to grab a bunch of files and append them into a single table? Now, before we had this feature, it was a painful manual task to take many different tables and append them into a single table. Or we had to use VBA. Now we just use Power Query. Now here's a note about the terminology that Microsoft uses when we want to append or combine tables. What we're trying to do is list the field names one time, all the records here, and then these records listed below, these records listed below that. Microsoft uses two different terms sort of interchangeably, either combine or append. For example, when we get to this dialog box, the word is combine, but what it really means is append. If we look up here, we have combine queries, but here they're saying combine is a merge, which is like a lookup, and it's also an append, which is what we want to do, stack tables on top of each other. So we really want to treat append and the word combine as synonyms. Now we have five examples, and we'll see how to do it the quick and easy way with a text file. We'll see how to dynamically add a folder path for CSV. We'll see that sometimes you can actually use the quick and easy way with Excel files, but only if you have a single object in each file. Then we'll see the complicated situation where you have an Excel file with many different objects. And then we'll deal with what happens if we have inconsistent field names, or the tables have blank rows and blank columns. Now we're going to start off with text files. So I'm going to double click and look inside. And the key to appending tables in any situation is all the tables have to have the same structure. That means we have to have the same field names, same number of columns, same data types. In this case, we have that so the append will be easy. Not only that, but if we add new files to this folder later, we just click Refresh, and everything updates. Now the process is exactly the same in Power BI Desktop and Excel. In Power BI Desktop, get data, more, and there's our connector. In Excel, it's the Get Data dropdown from file and from folder. Now, when I double click this, Power Query is pointing to the folder. So everything in here is going to be imported. Click Open. There's our preview. Now, normally we click Transform Data. But if you're 100% sure that the structure on all the tables is the same, we can come to Combine. Combine and Transform will combine the tables and open up the Power Query Editor. Combine and Load will combine them and load it to a new worksheet. And this one allows you to choose where to load. We're going to choose Combine and Transform Data. Now this feature is going to build a lot of code for us, so it needs a sample file. Now here's the list, but if all the tables are the same, it doesn't matter which one. Make sure you have the right delimiter. Now when we click OK, it's going to build a number of queries and steps to append the tables. Now here's the Finish Appended Table. That's at least one of the queries that it created. Here's a bunch of steps. But most importantly over here, it created a bunch of queries to help the append. It actually found the sample file, built a parameter, which is like a variable. Then here it used that parameter, and it built the two steps needed to transform each file, csv.document and table.promoteHeaders. Now later when we do this manually, we'll use csv.documentEmCode function and also this one. But here's what Power Query did. It took this code and then built a custom function. Then it used that custom function right over here. 
That custom function is what we will build later on ourselves manually. They used it in each row to get the correct table from the CSV file. And then it did a number of other steps. And finally, there's the result. If we click Source, Folder.Files, and there's the hard-coded on-premise folder path. Now two examples ahead. We'll see how to make this dynamic. Now we want to close and load as a connection only. Next, we want to import multiple Excel files. Now the problem with appending data from an Excel file is the Excel file can have many different objects, many different worksheets, many different tables. But if every single one of your files has the same table with the same structure, and every single sheet is named Sheet 1, then we can use this automatic process. We use the From Folder feature. Double click Single Table Excel Folder. Open. And in this step, we're going to combine and load. Click. And this is the step where we give Power Query a sample file so it can build the code. Now we can select whichever one we want. But the key is every single workbook has to have one worksheet, and it's got to be called Sheet 1. And that's because that's going to be hard coded into the M code. And the function that's built that works in every single row will be trying to extract a sheet called Sheet 1. So we select it, click OK. And there's the entire table. Now, if you did this and you forgot, and you're like, well, I don't want the .xlsx, well, this is a query, so we can go back and edit it. Anyway, we want to go look at the code, so I'm going to double click. And the step we want to look at is if we go to the step where they created the code and go to source, look at that. It used Excel.workbook instead of CSV.document. We go down to the query. We actually have two steps. Select the column, transform, extract, text before delimiter. I'll type a period, OK. Double click. We're going to call the sales rep and enter. Now we can go home, close, and load. And there's our finished table. Now in the last two examples, we hard-coded the on-premise folder path into the M code. With the CSV files, we're going to make it more dynamic. In Excel, we'll use the cell function. Over in Power BI Desktop, there's no cell function equivalent, but we can use a parameter. Now we already created this formula earlier when we created this query right here. Now I'm actually going to steal the code from this query. Double click. Now if we go to the source step, there's the code we created to get all of the files and folders from in that dynamic folder path. Now I'm going to copy this, Control-C, Escape, come up to New Sources, Other, down to Blank Query. And right up in the formula bar, I'm going to Control-V and Enter. Now folder.contents gets only the things directly inside the folder. That means files and other folders. But what I want is all the files inside of that folder. Now I could have created a second cell function pointing there, but I don't want to do that. I want just one dynamic folder path. But I'll show you a cool way to get at just the files in that folder. And the first step is we're going to change from folder.contents to folder.files. And when I hit Enter, the difference is with files, it'll get all the files plus all files and subfolders. So when I hit Enter, now I have just files, all the files directly in that folder and subfolders. Now I'm going to come back to Windows Explorer F2, Control-C, because I want to use the name of this folder inside the query. Escape. We're going to scroll over. And sure enough, one of the attributes for every file is a folder path. So I'm going to use the dropdown, Text Files, and we're going to do a Contains Logical Test or Filter. Click right here, Control-V, click OK. If I scroll over, there's exactly the files I want. If I look inside this folder, there are the files. Now we're making an assumption here. I hard-coded this into the query, which can be a safe assumption. Maybe if you're going to change the folder name, maybe you do contain CSV. But the important part is that we left all of this dynamic. 
this is what the cell function is getting. We just have to leave this folder, and I'm going to delete it and hit Enter, in the same place as the file that's pointing to that folder. And that's the same assumption we made earlier when we connected these two files. Now we're going to keep this field, and this is the column with the CSV files. I'm going to select Name, go up to Transform, and we're going to extract text before a delimiter, period, double click and rename. And now to get the CSV files, rather than build a custom function, I'm just going to run csv.document and table.promote headers in a separate column. Add column, custom column, csv.document, and we're going to put content. Let's just close parentheses and see what this delivers. There are the tables, field names in the first row. Click the gear icon. We'll add table.promote headers. And we'll put CSV inside. Click OK. Now we have our tables. We want to select this column, scroll over, hold Control, click, right click, remove other columns. Now we can use the Expand button. We do not want the prefix. Click OK. Hold Shift, click. Up to Transform. Detect data types. Check in to see if the data types are correct. And bam, there's our dynamic folder path to go and get a bunch of files in a folder and create a single appended and combined table. I've renamed everything, and I want to load this to a pivot table. Close and load to. Pivot table report on a new sheet. Click OK. I've created a simple pivot table. Now over in Windows Explorer, I want to get Shahara and Sue. Control C, double click Control V. And of course, the beauty of From Folder is whatever we put in here, it's going to be pulled into Power Query. And one of the benefits of loading a query directly to a pivot table instead of a table on the sheet and then the pivot table, which requires two refreshes, when it's loaded to a pivot table, we just right click Refresh. And bam, the data from those new files is in the report. Now in Power BI Desktop, if we want to dynamically connect to a folder, well, I don't know how to do that because we don't have a cell function. So what do we do? We build it hard-coded in and then use data source setting to change it later. As an alternative, we can use parameters. Now you still have to come into the Parameter Manage dialog box to change it, but maybe it's a little bit easier. And there's an extra benefit. Click the drop-down, New Parameter. We're going to name this. I named it Folder with CSV Files, gave it a description. The type will be text. And down here, I'm going to copy the actual folder path to the CSV files, and then paste it in current value. Click OK. And from within the editor, we can come up to New Source, More, Folder, click Connect. And lo and behold, off to the left, there's a drop down. We select Parameter, and here's our list of parameters that we can choose from. We'll choose CSV. Click OK. And then the steps as we did over in Excel are exactly the same. I'll let you complete those. Now here's our finished query. And if the folder path changes, since we have a parameter, we can go over to the Queries pane, select the parameter, and edit it right here, and Enter. Now when we come back over here, everything's updated. You can also come up to Manage Parameters, Manage Parameters, and select whichever parameter you want, and Edit. Our next From folder is going to be from the folder From Folder Multiple Objects Excel. And anytime you're importing and combining multiple Excel files, you always have to ask the question, are there multiple objects in any of the Excel files? If there are, then you have to be careful. We have multiple worksheets, each with compressor sales data stored in an Excel table. And each sheet tab holds the sales rep name. Over here, we have Define Names, Other Excel Tables, Advanced Filter, Print Ranges. All of those things show up as objects when we import this file into Power Query. The trick is to filter them out. 
Now when we import these files, we have a bunch of fields that we want to end up in the final table. We definitely want date, sales, and product. But we also want a field called city that will include the actual file name. And we want this new column in each table. So this column should say Sumner. And for each one of the individual tables on the sheet, it's got to have a second column called Sales Rep. This one should say Mo Everywhere. This one should say Samantha. And that is easy to do with Power Query. We can easily extract all the Excel tables, all the file names, and all the Excel table names, which are the same as the sheet tab names, and mark every record and every table with the correct attributes. I created query number 15 and did the same steps we did in our last example. For source, I used this bit of M code to get the dynamic folder path. And in step two, we did a contains logical test. But this time, we were looking for the folder with multiple objects Excel. Then from the file name, I extracted everything before the period. And then I renamed this column. Our next step, since we have an Excel file in each row, is from each file we need to extract a table of all the objects. So we'll add a column, custom column. We'll call it get table of Excel objects. And we'll use a function we've used before, excel.workbook. Now the content column has the Excel file in each row, so we'll use that. Earlier, when we used this function, we used the second argument, which promotes headers and tables but we have Excel table objects, so we don't need to put that particular argument in. That'll work. Click OK. And so now from each Excel file in each row, we have a table. And this table has five fields. Each record represents an object in the Excel file. Here's the names. This is the kind. This means that those are worksheets. Down here, here's what we're after, the Excel table objects. And so in each row, we get a new table of the objects from that particular file. Now we want to select this column, scroll over, hold Control, click City, right click, remove other columns. Now because the fields in every single table are the same and the structure is the same, we can expand to get a single table with all the Excel objects from all three files. So we'll click Expand, uncheck. We want all the fields, click OK. Now in the Kind column, you can see we have worksheet objects, Excel table objects, and some defined names. And earlier in this class, we used this column to filter to get just the objects we wanted. But in this particular case, the Excel tables have a consistent name, always starting with T underscore. So we can come to this field to get just the objects we want from all three files. Text filters begins with. We're going to type T underscore, click OK. And now the data column actually has the Excel tables. And you can see they're Excel table objects, so we didn't have to promote headers. It just shows the full Excel table object. And every single table in this column here has the same structure. So we can append. Before we do that, let's remove T underscore. So select, transform, extract, text after delimiter. T underscore, click OK. Now I want to rename, so I'm going to double click and call this Sales Rep and Enter. Now I want to select the columns in a certain order, so I'm going to select Data, Hold Control, City, Sales Rep. And now when I right click, Remove Other Columns, those fields will appear in the order in which I selected them. Now for these four tables, we have the city attribute, which was from the file name. When we expand, every single row in all four tables will get this attribute, whereas this table will get Cisco in every row. This table will get Chantel in every row. So we click the Expand button, uncheck. We want all the fields. Click OK. Now if you look up into the formula bar, table.expand columns, it does hard code the field names in. And if you didn't have consistent structure and field names in every row, then that would cause a problem. Now in an example coming up, we'll see an alternative to using the Expand button. And we'll use the table.combine function. Now the last step is to select all the fields, transform, detect data types, date, decimal, text. That is looking good. Now I've renamed everything. So we can close and load, close and load to. 
only create a connection, click OK. Now over in Power BI Desktop, I went ahead and created a parameter for that folder with the Excel files that have multiple objects. And then all the remaining steps are exactly the same. Now in query number 16, we're going to see how to import all the Excel tables from inside this current workbook. And we'll use the amazing function Excel.CurrentWorkbook. Now when you use this function, you can import Excel tables, define names, and arrays. But you cannot import sheets. And usually importing sheets is not a good idea. However, I do have a video which is sort of a hack if you want to check it out. All right, we need to scroll over and look at our Excel tables. Now on this sheet, Sue, we have a table with sales. Those are for Sue. Here's Chantel, Shahara. And each one of these tables has a name with a consistent naming convention, T underscore, and then the name. That way it makes it easy to filter to include just the tables we want. Because of course, we want to filter out other objects like the define name folder path, which we created earlier in this video. Now to use this function, we're going to go up to data, get data from other sources, and we're going to start a blank query. In the formula bar, we type excel.currentworkbook. It's an arguментless function, open close parentheses. And when I hit Enter, there are all the objects in this Excel file. Now i got to show you another great trick, sort of a hack. I'm going to close this and not save, discard. Let's go to one of our tables. And we're going to use our keyboard to import just this table, right click G. We'll delete this step. And of course, as we learned last video, that's key match lookup. All I have to do is delete all this to get back to the original table where that two-way lookup was working, Enter. So that's just a fast way without having to create a blank query. We definitely want to name this. Now the table returned by Excel.CurrentWorkbook is much different than the table returned by Excel.Workbook. For that function, we had a kind column. And that allowed us to filter by Excel table, define name, or array. So without that extra column, it makes it hard to filter by kind. But that's not a problem, because we have a consistent naming convention. T underscore starts all of the names for the Excel tables. Now, we have lots of other objects. This is the output from another query. Filter, advanced filter, define name, and even these arrays. Now, my rule of thumb is when I have a bunch of tables for a project, and I'm keeping them in a workbook and using Excel.CurrentWorkbook, I don't put any other objects in that workbook. If you do, just use a consistent naming pattern, so then it's easy to filter. For us, text filter begins with T underscore. Click OK. And because every table in this column has the same structure, we can right click, remove other columns, expand. Uncheck, click OK, transform, detect data types. It looks like this one is wrong, so date, replace. Now we can close and load, close and load too. Now if you wanted to consolidate all the Excel tables into a single master sheet, then you'd use table and load it to somewhere in the worksheet. Oftentimes this method is used, however, to keep all the data on different sheets, but create a single pivot table report. Now I'm going to leave it as connection only, but in just a moment I'm going to show you a well-known problem that could occur if you load it as a table. So for this one, only create a connection, click OK. Now to illustrate this problem, this is one of the files you can download. We have two Excel tables in this Excel workbook. I created this query which uses Excel.CurrentWorkbook. I loaded it to the worksheet. But the problem is the output from the query is an Excel table. So if my goal is to add new records and then come over and refresh, after we've loaded it the first time, every single time we refresh, it's going to try to import itself the output from the query, which is an Excel table. So refresh, and I have double the records. The solution is simple. We edit the query. And every single time you do this, you have to copy the query name. And we'll do it on the source step. And you filter out that as a possible name. 
does not equal, insert, paste the name of the query, click OK. Now close and load. And now we'll no longer have that problem. The output from this query will not be re-imported. Now our next two queries, 18 and 19, are going to be by far the most exciting queries we've done so far. But for each of these from folder queries, I don't want to have to create a new formula each time to get that dynamic folder path. That's what we did in all the earlier queries. So now, before we do these two queries, we're going to create a universal dynamic folder path query and then refer to that query every time we need the folder path. Now, last time we did this, we used this formula. Here's a Microsoft 365 formula that's much easier. Not only that, but this time I'm not going to give it a defined name. Remember, this is a formula, so when we try to import it, Power Query thinks it's an array formula and will assign it an automatic name. Now, as we mentioned earlier, if you're sending this to someone that doesn't have the most up-to-date Microsoft 365, then use the define name method. All right, you ready? Right-click G. Let's select Promote Headers. Right-click, Delete until end. Delete. Now there's our Excel.current workbook function. There's the key match to get the array object. Now we want to look up the first row and get that folder path. So we use our positional index operator. Zero really means first row. Square brackets. And then the default name, column one, and enter. Now here's the thing. If we save this and try to use this in other queries, we'll get a formula.firewall error. And that has to do with the interaction between queries. To avoid this error, instead of using the folder path, we get the contents of the folder landed as a table and then refer to the table. To do this, we use the folder.file function. Open parentheses, and then at the end, close parentheses and Enter. Now we'll name this. Now over here on the left, there's our query. We will refer to this in our next two queries. But we want to close and load, close and load to, only create connection, click OK. We're going to append when the field names are inconsistent. If they were all consistent, then all the columns would line up. If they're inconsistent, the columns will not stack on top of each other. The append will not work. In this case, we want to fix the field names. And we're going to learn a lot more about the csv.document function. Inside inconsistent field names, we have three text files. We'll use from folder to append. In the queries and connection pane, we're going to go to dynamic folder path and right click. And there's actually two options. Duplicate will create a new query and copy all the M code. Reference will just be like doing a cell reference a new query that points to the dynamic folder query. So that's what we're going to do. Click Reference. This will open up the editor. The source step is just a formula that says equals that query. Let's rename it. Now this table has all of the files and all the files in subfolders. So we want to come over, and one of the attributes for every file is the folder path. Now I'm going to go back over to Windows Explorer. F2, Control C, that's the name of the folder. Back over here, we're going to filter this column. Text filters, contains. We're going to Control V, click OK. And if we scroll over, there's our text files. Now, as we talked about earlier, the whole initial folder path is what's dynamic. This part we hard coded in. So if this changes, it doesn't work. But again, we're just going to keep this folder with our Excel file wherever we move it. We are not going to click Expand. We're going to build our own custom column, Add Column, Custom Column. We'll name the field. And we get to use csv.document. The first argument is where we put our text file. So I double click Content, comma. We have to tell CSV how many columns we want. You can put this in as a number or as a list with text field names. We have two columns, so I type two. Delimiter, this is where we have to know the M code for tab. Double quotes, pound, open parentheses, tab, close parentheses, 
comma, extra values, this argument says, what do you want to do with extra values? For example, if I say 2 here, and there's three columns. In the PDF notes in the csv.document function area, here's the rules, and here are four examples. If we have a table with three columns, that's what it looks like. But if we put 2 in and then put extra values.list or a 0, then it combines the last two columns into a list. If we say extra values error or 1, then if we say two columns and there's three, we get an error. This is the default. And then if we say extra values ignore or put a 2, then if we say 2 and there's three columns, it just hacks that last column off. Now we're going to backspace because we don't need to put anything in for that. Close parentheses. And now when I click OK in this column table, we see the field names in the first row. Now before we leave csv.document, what we just learned there is that there are four arguments. But there's an alternative. And actually, we already saw this when we used the automatic feature for CSV file. Now this is from query number one in this video. We click Source. And that record right there in the second argument of csv.document that's what's created when we click the From Text CSV button. And when I'm typing out my CSV.document like we just did, I don't usually do it this way. But here's how it works. And we have to really understand this just because this is what the built-in feature delivers. The record starts and closes with square brackets. There are five arguments, the first two delimiter and columns. Those are in the csv.document arguments themselves. But the last three arguments are only in this record. Now notice for tab and for columns, we have to put delimiter equal sign and then columns equal sign. This is the encoding. And then there's quote style and CSV style. Both of these options are options that I basically never use. But they do have some uses. I'm going to jump over to the PDF notes and show you examples in the csv.document section of our PDF notes. Here's a whole page just about this record. And CSV style, this is the one that I've never used. If anyone's ever used it or knows of a good use, let me know. Here's the data we start with. And if we do CSV style dot quote after delimiter, the quotes remain. If we start with the same data and use CSV style dot quote always, this is the result. Now quote style specifies how quoted line breaks are handled. So if we use quote style none and there's a line break within quotes, well the result is going to be two items with a line break. However, if we do quote style CSV, line break inside of quotes, well, we end up with two rows. And in fact, when we use this, any line break results in a new row. Now, even though we're probably never going to type this out, it's important for us to know so when we see something like this, we know our line breaks are going to stay within the cell and not spill to a second row. Now back to our task at hand. These are the three text files that we're trying to append. But check this out, sales with a dollar sign. These are different. Not only that, but someone had an extra space in that date field. If we tried to append these, the append would not work. Both of these columns would end up with lots of null values instead of correctly being under the date and sales field. This is what the table would look like if we didn't fix the field names. Well, here's our tables in this column here. And what do we need to do to fix? We need to skip the first row. Now, I've got to show you a great trick. Many times, we have to teach ourselves M code. So I'm just going to try remove top rows, put a 1, click OK, look up to the formula bar. And sure enough, there's a table.skip function. A table and how many rows to skip. So we X this out, click the gear icon. And after the equal sign, table dot skip, and then at the end, comma 1, close parentheses. Now when I click OK, we're missing the top row with those misspelled field names. Now that we have the default column header names, column 1, column 2, we can append. Now we're not going to use the Expand button and the table.expand column function. 
Now, that function will hard code the field names in. Now, in our particular case, it would not matter at all. But I got to show you an alternative method. We're going to use table.combine function, but that function requires all the tables as a list. That means from this table, we need to look up the column and return a list. Well, that's easy enough to do. We're going to come up to f of x. That's the table. We come to the end, and we use our field access operators. And I typed a super long name, so hopefully I typed this right. If I typed it right and hit Enter, I have exactly what I want, a list filled with tables. So we come up to f of x after the equal sign, table dot combine, open parentheses. And this will not hard code the field names in. When I hit Enter, it'll just combine with the existing field names. Now, before we dynamically change the field names, I want to close and load as a connection only. Over here on the dynamic folder path worksheet, we have two tables. This one we'll use in the last example. This is the Excel table that has the correct field names. Now, by adding an Excel table, if we get more columns later, it's easy to add a field name below. To bring this in, right click G. Get rid of change type. Now, this is an Excel table object, and we need to extract the field names as a list. So that whole thing is delivering a table. We just come to the end, field access operators. Hopefully, I'll spell this right, and Enter. Now, we have this over here, and we're going to access this query inside the 18th query. Now, before I show you the dynamic way, get this. If you're in charge of this query, and we need to store the correct field names somewhere, might as well just hard code them in. I'm just going to come up and double click, date, Enter. Double click, Sales, and Enter. So if I need to change them later, I just come here to this step and change them. Now, this will be helpful because we're going to have to manually type this out, table.rename columns, the table. And look at this. We need a list within a list. Old field name, new, old, new. But how in the world are we going to create a list within a list matching up individual elements if we have a list here? And we'll use table.column names to extract the column names from the current table. To do that, we're going to use a function called list.zip. And list.zip just takes two lists and converts them to exactly this, a list within a list with matched up elements. Now, we're going to build our formula step by step. But I'm going to grab this table here without the column names. F2, Control C, Escape. Click the last step, F of x, equal sign, Control V, and Enter. So we brought this table down. Now let's try and extract the field names. Table.column names, close and Enter. Notice that it's a list. Now I want to bring this list up here. And I'm going to put both of the lists inside of another list. So curly brackets. There's the first one, comma, C, F. I see it there, so tab, close curly brackets, Enter. Now I have a list. And within that list, there's the old field names and the new ones. Now we use list.zip. And close parentheses and Enter. And look at that, old, new, old, new. That's exactly what we need in the last argument of table.rename columns. Now up in the formula bar, we use table.rename columns. And in the first argument, we're going to need the table. And I'm going to use this table here. So double click, Control C, Control V, comma. And look at this, renames as list. That's exactly what we have. Close parentheses and Enter. And that's our dynamic method for renaming the fields. Now I want to add data types. But if I add this step here, it will hard code these field names in. So we'll go up to Combine Tables, and we'll apply it to the default names. We'll add our data type, Insert, go to the last step, and there's the data types. Now if we want to change the field names later, it's as easy as changing it here and then opening the query. And bam, there's the new name. Now over here in Power BI Desktop, everything's the same except for two things. I created a parameter 
instead of a dynamic folder path. And then in the query, we'll go to Advanced Editor. I used From Folder to start the query. All the rest of the steps are the same, except for where are we going to keep our new field names? Well, I'm going to click Cancel. We could keep them in a table. But guess what? I'm going to create a new blank query and just type a list with the correct field names. And when I hit Enter, there's my list. I just got to make sure to name it the same thing as I had over in Excel. And when I hit Enter and come back over here, it looks like I didn't spell the field name the same as over in Excel, but no problem. I come back to my list, edit, hit Enter, and now everything's working. All right, here's our last example in the video, and we'll do examples 19 and 20 together. And we're going to put everything we learned from last video all about M code and everything we learned so far in this video into one example. Now, we have a very specific problem here that we need to solve where we get blank rows and blank columns in our data set. Now, this is not a typical problem. But it does happen, and oftentimes when people are keeping their data in Excel, this problem pops up. Now, what we learn in this video about creating a dynamic solution and building custom functions, you can apply it to any problem. But our problem, blank rows, blank columns, inconsistent fields. And we'll see an amazing trick where we're allowed to have a dynamic set of field names and data types. That means we can apply our solution to different tables with different columns in different orders, even different number of columns. Now, here's the first folder we're going to point to. And inside, we have Excel files. And the file names have the city name, which we're going to need inside our sales table. And every single Excel file in both examples have exactly one sheet. Sometimes there's blank columns and rows. Sometimes no blank rows and columns. Sometimes just blank columns. Now we want to build a solution to deal with the blank columns, blank rows, inconsistent field names. And we want to apply data types dynamically. That way, when we point our solution to a different folder with Excel files, these tables have a different number of columns and a different order of names and data types. Our solution will just work. Not only that, but this example, together the tables have about 750,000 rows of data. Now we're using a different set of files for this example. There's a start file for Power BI Desktop and Excel. And same as in our last couple examples, we'll keep the destination files in the same location as the source folders, and everything will work dynamically. Now as a preview of the 10 steps we're going to do, first we're going to import a dynamic folder path to get at our files. Then we're going to import a table that has dynamic field names and data types. Then we'll extract a list of our correct field names. And then the heart of what we're going to do is we're going to build this amazing let statement, but it's going to act in a column on each one of the Excel files. And how we create this bit of M code without having to type it up is going to be a cool little trick. Then we combine the tables, and then we have to create a lookup table for data types. We create a dynamic list of list of whatever field names we're using and data types. And then in the last step in our query, we apply that dynamic list in list. And then we'll test different folders with different sets of field names and data types in our control sheet. Once we do this, we just click Refresh. Not only does the query update, but any reports pointing to that query update also. Now, I'm going to be doing it in Excel, but there's a start file if you want to do it in Power BI Desktop also. Now, if you're going to do this in Power BI Desktop, I don't know a function that can create a dynamic folder path. So I went ahead and imported the data type lookup table for the correct field name table with correct data types. And for the first part of the F sales table, I already imported the Excel file and put in a folder path. Those are not dynamic. So if you want to change them to match your computer data source settings, you change them here. And in the Power BI Desktop ribbon, 
transform data, and you can change the data source here. Now, I already completed a few steps. You can use either this formula or the other formula we used earlier in this video to create the dynamic folder path. But this time, join it to a cell. And in this cell, we have a drop-down list based on these different folders we're going to access. That way, we change the internal folder here, and that's the complete folder path. Then based on the folder we choose here, we'll enter the correct field names and data types. Then click Refresh, and it will all update. Now the cell with a dynamic folder path has a defined name, and we want to import that and this Excel table. So we click the From Table button, or use our keyboard, right click G. We want to rename this default name. This is going to be our final sales table, so we'll call it F Sales. Click on Source. This default name is not what we want to use. We want to use our defined name. We need to extract the folder path. So we use Positional Index Operator, 0 for the first row, Field Access Operators, and the default name, Column 1. Enter. Then we use Folder.Files. Close and Enter. Select, right click, delete until end. Now we'll come back to this query. But in the meantime, we're going to close and load to only create a connection, OK. Now I loaded the Excel table with the field names and data types. And I loaded it as a connection only query. We'll use this a couple of times. But for now, we want to reference it. So right click, reference. That simply does an equal sign to the name of the query. And our goal is to extract the field names as a list. So we use our field access operator, the name of the field, and Enter. I renamed the query and then load it as a connection only. Now the fun part. We come back over to F Sales. And for each row in this table, we need to extract the single Excel sheet and then make a transformation in every single row. Now we could come over and import a single Excel file, make the transformation, convert it to a custom function, and then run that in each row. But because the whole file is going to be a template that I use over and over, I want to create all the M code for the transformation in a custom column. Now there's no way I'm going to type out all that M code in a custom column. So we're going to see an amazing hack. And this is a strategy. We're going to use the user interface to generate all the code. And then we'll go up to Advanced Editor, move some things around, type a few things in, and bam, we'll have a formula that we can run in every row to make our transformations. Now we are going to need the city name as a new column in every single resulting table. So we'll select the column. I want to add a column, because that's the bit of code I'm going to need, Extract. Text before delimiter, period, click OK. Now that appeared all the way over here, but we got what we want as an extra column. Now we need to extract all the objects from the Excel files. Add column, custom column. This column will be the final column that fixes the table in each row. But in the meantime, we need to get the objects from the Excel file. So Excel.workbook. The content column has the Excel file. And we definitely don't want headers because we want the fields with inconsistent field names in the first row so we can remove them. Close parentheses, click OK. Now this function returns a table with all the objects and attributes. And every single Excel file will only have one object. So right after Excel.workbook, since this is a table, we can do a two-way lookup to get the sheets of data. After Excel.workbook, positional index operator for the first row, field access operator, default name data, Enter. And now in each row, that is some bad data. But we have the tables that we need to transform. Now the concept for how we remove blank columns and rows is pretty easy. Since we have a remove blank row feature, we can do that first and then transpose the table. The blank columns become blank rows. We remove those, transpose back. Then we remove the first row with the inconsistent field names. Now because I don't want to write all the code in the column, what we want to do is extract the table, 
build all the code based on one table. Then we'll go up to Advanced Editor and move the lines of code into the custom column. So I click on a table. I see blank rows, home. Remove rows, remove blank rows. Transform, transpose, back over to home. Remove blank rows, back over to transform, transpose. We want to remove the first row, home. Remove rows, top rows, one, click OK. Now we're also going to have to rename columns. So I'm going to create a line of code just typing any name for each one of these. There's our table.renameColumns function. But notice, how do we rename columns? You've got to have the old name and then the new name. And this is a list within a list. Over here, we have the list for the new names. These, if they were there, would be the existing names. And the way we create a list within a list, as we saw in our last example, is we use list.zip. So I'm actually going to build that line of code right here using the user interface. First, we extract the field names. So I click f of x, table.column names, close and enter. I need to put this list and this list inside of list.zip. And since that's a list, and it's got to be a list within a list, curly brackets, that's list, comma, and we want CFNS, and curly, close, and enter. And look at this, there's the full list, and then there's a list within a list. Now, of course, this is the wrong current field name, but because we're using table.columns, wherever we paste this code, whatever table is in the first argument, it'll get those field names. By the way, I didn't type date right, but that doesn't matter because it'll all be dynamic. Now, before we go and mash all these steps up into our custom column formula, I want to rename everything. Now that we've renamed them, we can go up to Advanced Editor. Right after the first step, I'm going to hit Enter. Same with right here. This line of code, this is where we actually take the city name and assign it to a new column. We're going to cut this, Control-X. And that's going to come right before naming the fields. So remove top row, Enter. And I'm going to Enter twice and Control-V. Now, this line right here, up to each, that's the custom column where we're going to fix everything. So all of this code right here is going to go after each in a let statement. So after Excel.workbook, backspace, Enter, let, Enter. At the end, Enter, in. Now here's the amazing thing. We're going to use all this code with some adjustments after each, and it will run in each row to fix the tables. Now we're going to adjust some things, but let's see if we can hit Tab. So all of this is going to be a bunch of steps to deliver a fixed table for each row. And in fact, this will be the last step that this query here, fsales, delivers. So I'm going to double click. And for in, we put it at the end. Notice let, in, those go together. All of this is in the custom column. Now the first step is getting the worksheet. And this step needs a name. One Excel sheet, equal sign, and there's a row, parentheses. That actually was going with table.column. When I backspace, we have to remember to put that at the end after we're done with all this lovely let M code. We do not need this temp step, so we can simply delete. And now this line is where we remove the blank rows. But of course, it was looking at temp, and now it needs to look at this variable. So Control C. Control V. The transpose line, it's already looking at the previous step. And look at this, I forgot to name this. Remove blank rows 2. And of course, that's looking at transpose 1, which is correct. Double click, Control C. This needs to be Control V. Skip is looking at the previous step correctly. Now we get to get city name, table.addColumn. 
with a formula to add city name in each row. And if we take Remove Rows, Control-C, and Paste in the first argument of the function in the next step. Now there's a big problem here, because remember, as we talked about last video when we create custom functions, this is each inside of table.addColumn, but that's trying to access the outside table. And we learned how to access the outside table a few different ways. But the easiest way is to just define a variable. Now the reason we can get away with defining a variable for the name column here is because it comes after each, which is working inside of this table.add column, which is working across the outside table. So tab, we'll call it city name equal, and this field from the outside table, although it won't work inside of each, inside of table.column, control X, it works fine as a variable in table.addColumn. So control V and a comma, double click, control C, and right there, bam, there's city name. Now the next line is where we rename. It's definitely got the wrong table we want to put. Get city name, control C, control V. That's definitely not what we want, but we were smart and built this line of code right here. Control X and the list within a list, control V. Now we have to make sure because we need table.columns to look at the previous step. So copy. Notice this line has get city name twice from the previous line. We do not need this. Delete. I don't need the comma because we're about to hit in backspace. And this is going to be the output. Now let to in and all the steps to transform the tables comes after each. So what do we need right here? We've got to remember to close off table.add column up here. Actually, there's a third argument, but we're not going to use it. So close parentheses. Also, it looks like when we recorded the code in the user interface, get city name was before fixed tables, so it's looking at the wrong name. We really want the previous step, double click Control V. And that hack should work. If I click Done, scroll over. That is amazing. Each table not only fixed blank columns and rows and gave it correct field names, but it also added this column. So our next step is to combine. And we're not going to use this button. We're going to use the table.combine function. And table.combine does not need a column of tables. It needs a list. Not only that, we want to remove all the other columns. But we don't need to remove them directly. With a bit of efficient M code, we can do both steps together. Notice fixed tables is there. It's this whole table, f of x. How do we extract a column as a list from a table? We just use field access operators, the name, fixed tables, enter. And there we have exactly what table.combine needs, a list of tables. Up in the formula bar, table.combine tables as a list, close, and Enter. Now the last step is to change data types. And before we do it dynamically, if your names are set and they're not going to change, then you can actually hard code this step in. Transform, detect data types, verifying data types, looking good. But hard coding these is not what we're after. We want everything to be dynamic. Now let's rename the steps and load as a connection only. Now let's change this from date er to dates and enter. We can already see we have an error. And that comes from hard coding this in. Now we could manually come up, change this to s and enter. But that's not what we want to do here. We want to make this fully dynamic. Now to make everything dynamic, we're going to have to create a data type lookup table. This is a table of data types from video number 12. Here's an Excel table I created with the data type names and the actual M code for data types. Now over in the correct field name table, I added data validation for this lookup value so it matches the first column of our lookup table. 
That way, over in our query, we'll have the correct field name, a lookup value that will allow us to retrieve the correct M code. Now let's scroll over. And here's the M code for our lookup table. And this whole trick right here I got from the Power Query Master, Bill Sizzes. Now we're going to copy, Control-C, click outside, Get Data, Other, Blank, Advanced, and instead of double quote, double quote, Control-V. Now we have a lookup table with the data type name, M code for data type, name, correct M code, click Done. Now we have our lookup table. So over in CFN, we look up the correct data type to match with the correct field name. Now let's name this data type lookup table. Now what do we need to make this fully dynamic? If we look at add data types, there's a list within a list, correct field name, data type. So we come over to CFN, right click Reference, Rename, List within a list, Name Type. We want to look up Data Type. So Home, Combine, Merge. There's the Lookup Value. There's the Lookup Table, Column to Match. Click OK. There's our new column, Expand, Uncheck, and we only want Data Types. OK. We don't need type name anymore because our goal is to get correct field names and data types into a list within a list. Right click Remove. Now to convert each row to a list and all of them together a list, you're not going to believe the M code function. I would think it would be a list function, but it's a table dot two rows. Close parentheses and Enter. And bam, there it is. Correct field name, data type. Correct name and type. Now we're going to rename the steps. Now we're going to use this query name over in F Sales. The last step, table.transform columns, highlight list within a list, control V. Click at the end and enter. We don't see anything different, but you're not going to believe this. Close and load, close and load to. All is a connection only. Just for a moment, I'm going to try date time. We'll select from the drop down. Double click to open. And that is amazing. Now, what's going to be even more amazing is when we test this whole Power Query solution on a different folder of data with different columns and different data types. Close and load. Now before we test a different folder of data, I want to load this to a report. So we have a report, a query, a data source. Then we can see how truly dynamic it is. Now I changed the name and data type back. Let's come over here, right click, Load to, Pivot Table Report on a new worksheet. Click OK. And both data sources will have a product and a sales. So I'll drag product down to rows, sales. Add some number formatting. And we probably wouldn't have two different folders connected to the same pivot table, but you could, as we'll see. Now, remembering the data set, we have different field names, different folder. Now, on the Control Sheet, we'll change the folder to the Big Data folder. We're going to copy the field names and data types, expand the bottom of the table, Control V. Now, we come over to our pivot table. Click inside the pivot table, right click, and before I click Refresh, there are 750,000 rows of data, so it's going to take about 20 seconds. Click, and bam, our report has updated. Here's the query, 750,000 rows. Look inside the query, everything is working. So Advanced Editor, that's some pretty awesome and fun M code. Wow, that was an epic video all about Power Query importing data, transforming the data, and a lot of awesome, powerful M code. We talked about importing single files, including a dynamic file path. We talked about Microsoft Power Platform, an SQL database, from folder with individual files, from folder when we have Excel files with many objects. We saw Excel.workbook. Then we saw the Excel.current workbook. 
We saw a universal dynamic folder path, how to deal with inconsistent names, and our finale, a completely dynamic solution to deal with lots of bad data. All right, if you like that video, be sure to click that thumbs up, leave a comment, and subscribe, because there's always lots more videos to come from Excel is Fun. All right, we'll see you next mix video.